Welcome to today's lecture in the Halmstad Colloquium series. It's a great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Kalla Jonsson. Kalla is the director of the Access, the KTH Access uh, Linneo Center, and he is a professor in the School of Electrical Engineering at KTH. Kalla started his career doing his master's thesis and PhD fairly close by at Lund University. And then after that, he went off to have an illustrious career, um, including visits to Berkeley for postdoc and uh, Caltech, and also collecting several uh, prizes and young investigator awards from uh, Ericsson and Scania and the highly selective uh, Wallenberry Scholar uh, Award and also leading several important research projects uh, funded in Sweden, funded by the Swedish uh, agencies and by the EU as well. Um, Kala is an expert in control, communications and basically cyber physical systems. So it's a real pleasure to have him here with us, uh, telling, his, telling us about some of the very exciting work that he's been doing over several years. So without further ado, please welcome Kala. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, Ali. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be back. It was here two years ago and I enjoy it very much. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, event-based control. Uh, it is, as, uh, as you heard, it's, it's actually something we have been working on for quite some time now. I view this as a, a bit of an enabling technology for using wireless much more than what you do today. Using wireless networking, wireless communication in many new type of application domains and particularly those where we are doing closed loop control. So what I'm going to talk about here is, is joint work with many students, collaborators and so on. Some, some of them are listed on, on this slide. Uh, I put a lot of material in. Uh, I think the, the slides will be posted somewhere, right, afterwards. I won't make it. In the program, I, I saw this thing that I have one hour and 15 minutes. I thought, are they really running this, uh, <laughs> this uh, tough guys in Hamster here? But I, I, I put a lot of material. So if you're interested in some more in the detail, there are more in the end, which I won't cover in the, in the talk. I will mix this, talking a little bit of application, talking a little bit of, of some theory, hopefully something for everybody. But the starting point, the motivation of this is really the technology push, as I said. I mean, this thing about that we get cheap computation sensing and, com uh, and computations all around us. So we can suddenly start building these type of systems where we integrate technologies from different type of, of disciplines. So this is what I'm interested in. And when when I build this system, what I then get is something I call a wireless control system. So what is that? I mean, a control system is something, it's a process, a plant that you are applying sensing and activation to. So it's something where you are sensing what's going on, you compute some actions and you make the plant act the way you want. When we now talk about wireless control system, it's just so that some of these interconnections here now are wireless links. For instance, in the sensor network here, it can actually be a wireless sensor network and so on. So this is where we are, are coming from. So why bother about this at all? The thing is now that we start to share resources in these type of systems. So we have now some common resources, right? We share the medium and maybe also we share some of the components here. Uh, so we need to, to handle that somehow. And we need to handle it in such a way so that we have some guaranteed performance of our closed loop. So if this is a cruise controller, if it's, this is some control system where we are doing some vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, controlling a platoon of cars, or if this is in a factory where we are controlling some flow or something like that, we have some objective that we need to maintain. 
And when we do that now, so when we are combining the control technology here with the wireless communication, we get a very interesting clash here. Because control theory, digital control, has been developed for 50, 60 years based on the paradigm that things are sampled periodically. Just like in signal processing, it's digital, we, we, we sample it periodically, typically. While if we look at wireless communication, wireless networking is built on the paradigm of event-based and ad hoc. We should be able to get into this room with a computer, the computer itself tells when it needs to communicate. So you see, we have these two paradigms that doesn't fit together. And so one idea that we had, and, and many with us was can we now build the control theory where we are actually doing control, not periodic, but event-based. So if you want, we, we act when we need to. So if it's not broken, don't fix it, as someone said when it comes to this event base, right? So can, can we do that? And this is what I'm going to talk about, a little bit about some, some theory here, but also a lot about applications. So I will start from the application, something of what we have been, been working on, and particularly I will, will talk mainly on, on process industry, just to focus on something. And then I'm going to talk about some fundamental problem which comes in here, how we can solve scheduling and control problem jointly. Then I will take a view, uh, the view of a wireless networking person here. How can we exploit the kind of protocols that we have around us today? Can we use them in certain ways? And then I will switch over and view it from a control viewpoint and see that what happens now if I apply this technique and I, for instance, have lossy networks as we always, as, as we sometimes have. Extensions I would have, won't have time with and then we come to some conclusions. I would be more than happy if this is interactive. So just, uh, just uh, ask questions and, 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 and so on whenever you want. Okay, so let's look at some, some applications. So, uh, uh, let's look at the process control. So this is the, the communication network in an industry today. This happens to be a slide from ABB, but it could be Honeywell, Siemens, or anywhere. And what you see here is that you see that there is a, a number of, uh, of computer buses, a number of computers connected. From a real-time control perspective, the only important thing is what's going on here in the lower left corners. So here we have out on a local bus, a field bus or something similar, you have sensors and actuators being connected. So this could be pressure sensors and this could be valves for instance. And then these data are communicated up to a rack of basically PC computers. These PC computers are running a computer code which are generating control signals which are then sent out to these actuators and acting on the, on the system. So this is the state of the art. It started in the 70s and it's still and it's like this. So you see that it's a very centralized architecture. And we we close all the, the loops here are closed over wired uh, over wired links. So what is happening right now is that when we look down here, we start seeing wireless. Uh, networking there. So if we zoom in in that part, we can get a picture like this. So locally down there at the, at the local bus, we get a wireless sensor and actuator net, oh sorry, a wireless sensor and actuator network. And when we have that, we could then start closing loops locally. Why should we necessarily use this centralized architecture and communicate up there? What should we do locally? What should we do centrally? So we can start closing this, this data over this, this uh, network, this wireless network. As you see, it might be a, a multi-hop network because we might have limited communication resources in some of these devices. So this has a potential now, if we look into the future, and we would like to have the completely wireless process plant, that we get a whole new type of technology, more or less like we have done already in our offices and in our homes, right? Going from having wired infrastructure to wireless. So this is the same thing is, is, is now starting to, to, to be going on in, in the industry, where we go from then centralized systems to more flexible and distributed systems. 
We go from having few dedicated computers, but today we can have computers everywhere here, right? So the intelligence of the system can be moved out from that central point out in the, in the plant. It could have drastic uh, effects on how we are operating the system. Operators today don't have to sit any longer than in the operating room. They can be out on the floor here, right? And, act, and interacting with the system through wireless devices. So this is a trend that we, that we see. Just flashing through a few projects that we have been involved with that you, that you see that we have tried some of this out in, in reality. This video here comes from um, a test plant that we did with Bowleden. This is called the froth flotation process. It's basically huge tanks that you use to get the mineral out of the ore. So you send in the ore into this, you see it's 40 cubic meter. They look like these big beers, basically with froth on top. And that was the shiny thing that you saw here, right? This is froth, and that's where the mineral is. And then you send it through several of these tanks. It's just one of the classical control problems. You regulate the level in this tank. So you need some control in order to, to have, this, uh, have this working. So we, we did basically a proof of concept together with ABB and, and Bowleden on, on these things. Uh, so uh, you see this is, for instance, how the wired links looks in these plants today. We, we, uh, we replace some of the wireless link with, uh, with just Zigbee. Uh, connections. Nothing fancy, nothing fancy on the communication side, nothing fancy from the control side. Actually the cr control is pretty bad here. But it was, it was a proof of concept. So we wanted to be able to show that this can be done. It's not a problem. You take something which is easy to control. Imagine the time constant of such a huge tank. So you can basically lose connectivity forever and it still won't happen anything, right? If you, so if you go in industry, you wouldn't get the most critical loop. We have been talking about uh, uh, pulp and paper, paper mill also, right? Which is an interesting thing, trying to get that wireless, particularly the, the sensors which are going very fast over there. But you have to be uh, much more careful because if you break a, a, a paper tray there, it, things can go really bad. So this was really like a proof of concept. This can be done and we learned a lot about this, what, what is, is uh, the challenges and what, uh, what one needs to do. Uh, let me show you something uh, that... Uh, illustrate one of the challenges. If you look at these pictures here, right, it doesn't look like uh, the nice uh, office spaces here at Hamster University, right? It's quite different. So, so one of the things we have been doing has been to actually measure the radio environment here and try to understand that. And this project was together with the group in Uppsala, Anders Alliance uh, group there. So they went out with test rigs and measure, now this is a received signal strength, between nodes out in that environment. So it was not closed, no important data going over, but just checking, looking out, how, what does it look like? This is uh, a one, uh, 20 hours here, right? So you see the, some characteristics here. Of course, it's fluctuating a lot. There is a lot of, uh, of noise here because there are a lot of machines and so on, but also other things. Suddenly, the, the strength becomes much, much better here. And, so, uh, and things like that. So what was this due to? So there are things like you move in the factory, you move huge things, right? And you cannot, you cannot tell the people who work there that now when we put these wireless nodes up you cannot do what you used to do, right? And you cannot ask them for specification, how are you going to move the next year? So we, in developing this technology, we need to understand a little bit what type of fluctuation, what type of, of ways do you have to, to work in order to be able to compensate for this. So this was some of the, the just to illustrate some of the application in the process industry we have, have been working with. Um, since, as I know, you're also working with... Uh, with platooning here, let me just mention that also in this context, only one, uh, one slide because it's one of my favorite uh, uh, applications now. So if you look into the vehicle platooning, as you know we are doing vehicle to vehicle communication there. Also there, this thing about event base is very important because as those of you who work in this business know that the protocols that are used, such as 802, which should be there, 802.11p for instance, it's a broadcasting, an event-based broadcasting protocol. 
So it's not the protocol that, 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 so to say, enables you to do periodically sample as, as such. You need to build something on the application layer to cover that. And this has important implication if you now would like to, to regulate the distance between these tracks and, and so on, how this should be done. Because you couple now these two, two, two principles which doesn't really fit all together. So we are looking into that also, how to, how to solve this um, this type of, of uh, problems. Um, okay, so let's go on and look a little bit more into the, the sciences on, 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 this, uh, on this problem. And let's, uh, let's look at now from um, a, a control wireless networking viewpoint. So, um, so basically in all this situation you have a number of plans that you would like to control you are communicating measurements over a wireless network. You are communicating that to controllers. So these controllers could be different control codes running in one computer or could be multiple computers, right? And then you, here I remove the wireless on this side because in many cases you have wired link because actuators need to be wired because they are often powered. So, one interesting question to start with here is, okay, so in this picture, as I draw it, the plants and the controllers are separated, right? And this is true in actually many applications. If you think about the vehicles, two vehicles, two different positions in, in Hamsta is not coupled, right? They are, are two separate systems. If you take that big industrial plant, if you take two, most of the loops there are not coupled because of the physics. I mean, things that are close by might be coupled. So in many cases, things are not coupled, right? But now if we share a medium where we are communicating data, we are coupling them. So we need to understand, for instance, who should have access here. This coupling here, if we don't do anything, things can go very wrong, right? So how should we do that? And there are basically three guys here who can make decisions about that. One is to do like our computers are doing, right? They, so the sensors could tell when they want to have access, right? So the sensor itself could just uh, make that decision. Now I think I have something to send and then I, I try to send it. That's one. A little bit more centralized solution is to have a network manager. For instance, if we take the standard wireless heart, you have a network manager, someone who is responsible for who had get access. So this you can have and this makes a decision now and communicate this information. If you look at from a control estimation viewpoint, who has the best information in this, in this plot? The, the, the guy who has most information is the computer over here, right? Because he col collects all the data. He knows when I need to act. So you can also imagine that the controller here says, now I need some data about that sensing because I haven't heard anything for a long time or I, I think something has been going on. So you see that different architectural things, and depending now how we design our system, that could have strong influences on the performance that we can achieve. And we could map, if we spend some minutes here, we could map, for instance, the, the application I show you, with this uh, vehicle platooning, with the process control and so on, we could map that to this picture and see what, what, is, what type of technology should we push because we would like some, uh, some particular performance. Here, if you start, I mean, we will start discussing this, the first uh, guy there. So making decisions locally, uh, following just uh, what we know from wireless, wireless networking. So let's make, let's look at the most simple problem we can think about in this, in this context. So again, here we have a plant we want to control, we measure X, we send it to the controller and the controller computes something to act. So it's just a standard control loop. When I now introduce a scheduler here, what I do is that I introduce a, a new guy here, I call him S, and what he does is that he look at X and then he makes a decision, should I close this relay or not? If I close the relay, the only thing that happens is that X then gets over to the controller. If it's open, nothing is being communicated here. So now it's an interesting question. Can I design the way that I schedule communication? Can I design that scheduler separate from the design of the controller? 
Why is that interesting to try to understand such separation? Uh, just to give you some example from the literature, what did Shannon do? Shannon understood that we could separate source coding from channel coding, right? in the 50s, and that uh, gave the revolution of digital communication. So that was an architectural principle. We could do that separation. It helps a lot of design. We have the Turing, of course, with the computation, with the program and the, and the computation, right? Just the same, and the von Neumann uh, model, just the same thing. Uh, and in control, all you have Kalman filtering and state feedback, right? <laughs> so if you can do these things, it's very powerful to understand what, what architecture is there. This was actually some, some proposed in the literature that you could do that. Uh, I had a, a, a student who got very interested in, in, in this. She didn't believe in that. I didn't believe in it either, that it could be, 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 be right. So let me show a little bit how one can reason. I won't go into any detail here. But just to, to go back, how could we reason about how this problem could be solved? Of course, we need to put some mathematics. What are we controlling? We could control a linear system driven by some noise, right? The scheduler, what is that? The scheduler is something which just generates a zero or a one, depending on the information available at the scheduler, right? The controller, based on the information available at the controller, just generates a control signal. And the G and the F here are just two maps. And you can say that the design problem here could be to minimize the variance of X while using as little control as possible so that it minimizes the variance of U. So this is a very reasonable and classical type of, of, uh, of control problem. You want the variance to be, be small. And so you want to minimize that functional over F, F and G here. Uh, yeah, so here is, uh, is her name, Shithrupa Ramesh, who has been working on that. I won't go into uh, the, the theory of this, but basically the, uh, and the first answer is negative here. One cannot do that. You cannot, what, what do I mean? You cannot separate the design of scheduling and control and still achieve the, the true optimal closed loop system. So this is a negative result. This, can, this cannot be done. And there is, is uh, mathematics behind, be, behind this. So what is, uh, what is a positive thing here? The positive thing is that if, when you start thinking like that, you could think about that at the scheduler here, you could introduce something at the scheduler so that a controller which is based on this separential principle with a control and a, an observer, still this is a viable controller. Yes, please tell me. Wouldn't you get an optimality goal if you set a price also for the communication? No, that's an, uh, that's, an excellent, uh, that's an excellent question. No, you can actually, uh, you can actually reformulate that, and we, we, uh, we have done that. So, so let me just uh, repeat your question, so, uh, because it, it makes very much sense. So when you do this type of control, it's typical so that you would like to minimize also the use of the channel, right? And in the formulation here, you can add that. So you can add plus lambda. So you want to minimize this quantity together with lambda. And it's actually just happened, but one needs to, to prove that, that it doesn't matter in this, in this case. So you, you, you still get the same problem, you cannot do the separation. But uh, it's an interesting formulation to think like that, because uh, I should maybe have used that instead of this one, right? Because what you want to do is that you, in your design you want to have control about how much resources of the communication you use, together with how much resources of the control and computations. And there is like a trade-off now that you need to do, which is interesting. But in doing that trade-off, my point was that in doing that trade-off, you could not separate these two or three problems and solve them separately if you don't restrict the architecture. And one way you could restrict the architecture, I'm going to, to show next here. So you can restrict the architecture inside that box of how you are designing the scheduler. I know this is a messy slide, but just just, uh, just look at the colors here basically. So what we say is that in when you make the decision at the scheduler, you need to mimic somehow what is the control action that you are taking. This is a message. You need to have some representation of, of that somehow. 
And then the way you can make the decision in the scheduler could be something like this, like a threshold condition. So you say that you schedule if your measurement is sufficiently different from let's think first of your previous measurement, that could be the... but if you think about it, that is not enough, right? That it, it should be different from the previous measurement. What it should really be different from is what the controller and observer think about that the, pre the, the measurement is, right? So that's why it says x hat, uh, xk hat uh, k given tau k minus 1, which was the previous Value. So the information that you have here is some information which is old, but based on that information you would do the best prediction. And then the decision if you should communicate here or not should be based on that information. And that one can then show that this is, uh, this is a good way of, of doing that. So uh, let's now move from, from a problem which is one can dig into uh, with, with very interesting type of, of control uh, theory tools. Instead moving up a little bit. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Was this an optimal way of having a state-based Scheduler? No, no, this is a good point. So we, uh, so uh, the, the number one, you cannot if you want to optimize your scheduler and controller, the typical optimal controller will not be that controller with a Kalman filter, an observer, plus the state feedback. In general, it would not be. And so, so we have counterexample showing that this, this is the case. So it can be very, very complicated things, which is optimal. But instead of going for the optimal then, we are going in that direction trying to, to find a good architecture. And then we say that for certain types of scheduler, like this one for instance, if you choose that, then the best observer and controller is one which can be separated like that. You see, it's kind of, you don't know how much you lose, but you know that if you choose that one, which intuitively seems reasonable, you get a nice architecture here. So from an architectural viewpoint, from an implementation viewpoint, that is very nice, right? And I think that in many, when we do this developed design principle, it's often so that we, there is a trade-off. We shouldn't go for optimality, right, all the time. We should go for something which is good enough, but also is, is, is nice to implement. So that was a little bit the, the point there. But let's move up a little bit. I will go through a few, a few steps. We get closer now to the implementation and to the kind of protocols that we see that we have around there in, in, in wireless networking. And um, uh, for those of you who work on wireless networking, you know about contention resolution mechanisms, right? If we have several uh, several transmitters that want to communicate sim simultaneously, we, we not need to resolve if there is a conflict. And this is called contention resolution mechanism. So in the picture I showed you earlier, we can introduce that, right? We can say that we don't just have one sensor that tries to communicate. We will typically have many loops, many who try to communicate simultaneously. And if there is a conflict now of using the wireless medium here now, we need to be able to resolve that. We need to have this conflict resolution mechanism. So one can now think about, about that problem, but of course, as I will see, show you uh, uh, here, what is, sits there typically is quite complicated, which means that this in general is a hard problem, because you see what you, what you get now, if, if for instance, if, if S1 here tries to communicate and S2 tries to communicate simultaneously, one of them needs to back off. If they back off, if S1 backs off, that will influence the feedback control loop here, so that will influence the state of the control loop. So you can see that the communication of other loops influence these loops. So in general you can just get the feeling for that we get something which is very, a very complicated object. So can we do something about that? So can we do something about it when we start using, for instance, a type of Mac medium access control protocols that are out there today? And the answer is yes, we can do something about it, but we have to be a bit careful. So one need to, first of all, you need to model, you need to model what is going on here, right? And uh, let, let's just go through a very simple model for that, and that's the old one, the CSMACA, Carrier Sense Multiple Access with Collision Avoidance, which is one of the standards, right? So what, 
<coughs> so what happens there? If, so if you have a device, it's basically the same thing that we have in our computers, right? So when the computer wants to communicate, the first thing that it does is that it waits. It waits a random amount of time, then it sends a channel. If the channel is free, it transmits, and then it goes back and waits here. And it only acts if there is something to send. And then there is certain things here, if someone else is, is transmitting here, we, will have a, we could have a collision and we need to go back and so on. So you see, this is nothing like a finite state machine, or if we pop, put probabilities now on how packets are generating, probabilities on when failures occur and so on, we get a Markov chain. So you see, we have a Markov chain here now describing the conflict resolution mechanism. So if we go back in this picture, remember here I had some differential equation or difference equation, stochastic differential equation. Here I now have a Markov chain. So you see, I, I'm, I'm living in the same type of space, right? So I can combine this into some sort of hybrid system. I can analyze that. So, so this is one thing one, one can do. The thing is when you, everything is correlated, if the, if the CSMACA of the different nodes are correlated, this becomes a problematic thing. Yes? Uh, I'm a layman here, so uh, I do not understand how does this uh, do collision avoidance. I think this is more collision detection, isn't it? No, because what, what you do, so the way you avoid, let, let's uh, look at the two, two different ones who are, so, so let's say that I have two of these next to each other. Mm -hmm. so, so if I have now S1 and S2, both of them try to communicate, it's like having two, two of these machines running in parallel, right? right? So then what could happen is that two of them try to transmit simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Or one could be, no, let's make it simpler in that case. So let's say that one is here in sense channel, right? Mm -hmm. And the other one is transmitting. The one who is in sense channel now will then sense that the other one is transmitting, so then it gets a failure there, right? So it will go back and do a random and wait a little bit more. While the other one who transmitted will succeed, because the one who is sensing is not sending anyone, right? It's sensing. So then it goes back there, and then the, the, next, the, the second one then come back here, do a ra wait, a random amount, then come here, sense channel, no one else is then sending, and then transmit. But both can be in sense channel, and with some delay, then we could both start... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this was, yeah, yeah. So, in what sense is it different from collision detection? So, in what sense is it CA and not CD? That's my question. Oh, the, this uh, collision avoidance. Right. Yes, yes. Oh, you mean why it's called collision? Ah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, this is like. Uh, I think the it's, it's long. collision detection is part of collision avoidance. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, you, you sense there to avoid as many collisions as, as much, but you can still not prevent collisions from happening. Yeah, and then yeah. You have to detect that there is a collision. Avoidance. Yes, yes. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so, so this, just to, to, to give you a fair, I mean, this is what is implemented typically today, I mean, in most of the wireless devices that we, that we are using. So what I just would like to give you an impression about here is that uh, things get correlated if we have many of these devices. And how can we handle this, this uh, correlation? And there was a, a, a brilliant idea by Giuseppe Bianchi. So this is one of the most cited papers in wireless networking. He studied ATAN 2.11 and he just come up with this idea. What if I, if I assume that, the, roughly speaking, that events in here are independent? They will not be independent in reality, but what if I assume that and I treat them independently in a clever way? What we did was that we took that idea and applied that to 802.15.4, the de facto standard for wireless sensor networks and for wireless heart and these other things. Just to give, I won't go into any detail here, but just give you a flavor. So the, then this is the real protocol now, the 15.4. Uh, if we now start doing this modeling, you see the, the, the Markov chain become huge. It's become very complicated and so on. But, so what can one really use this for? 
So one thing you can use this for is of course numerical evaluation. Instead of implementing stuff you can run. You can run this Markov chain as a model of the true system. Another thing you can do is that you can now try to reduce the order of this system, right? You have a dynamical system that you that you, is useful and you can reduce that and this is something that we work on. Uh, this model now of course is very important to validate that also and we have, have done that in experiments and so on that this, this works. So this was one part of, of, uh, of the story that I would like to tell you. Let's jump over to a quite a different view of the wireless network. You see here we look at it more on, on that layer of the Mac in the OSI stack. So let's look at the wireless network from a scheduling viewpoint. So we think of, of just the wireless being a resource that we, we schedule. So more like a CS approach if you want to it. And so this is what I call exploiting wireless network protocols. So these protocols are often slotted. So you have a, what is called a super frame which has a length of capital N which is repeated over and over again. They are divided into two, two types. One is contention free and one is, is called the contention access period which are repeated over and over again. The contention free period is such that if it's allocated to one sensor and then that is the only one who is supposed to use that slot. So it's, it's kind of a TDMA here, right? So if the blue sensor now always uses the second slot, for instance, no one else can do that. The second thing, the second period is the contention access period. So this is using that type of CSMA that I, I talked about, right? So there it could be so that the, the red and green use different slots or they can use the same and we need to then resolve. Again, this is in, in basically all the, all the standards that is, is out there, they have this possibility. Our idea here has been to, okay, how can we now try to build this system so that we utilize the fact that we probably have both of them. So, so why not using one? If you go back now thinking about doing it periodically sample, right, you should just do this. The problem is that you have a limited number of these, these slots. So if you just have 10, but you have 100 nodes that need to communicate, who should have what slot? Who should have these? You, not everyone would be. The problem with these ones is that you can collision. What if you have sensors now, and it's typically so, right, that when something goes wrong, you have a big disturbance, then suddenly all the sensors are sending phenomena they want to communicate, then you get a lot of collision, and then you are into prob problem, right? So you see it's kind of, uh, uh, nature is working against you here. So there is something that needs to be, to be resolved. So let's discuss that uh, um, a little bit here. How can we exploit the mix of, of those, those two? And I just want to do that a uh, little bit like, a, like an animation, a PowerPoint animation, just to illustrate a little bit the, the, how, how this can be done. So this is a way, so think now that we just have one guy in the middle that we are communicating to, we have a number of wireless devices. And it's basically a problem now of telling what slot should go to what, what device. So, so this is a super frame, right, which is repeated over and over again. So in the standards, it's so that you have actually six, only 16 slots here. So it's, it's, rather, it's rather small and you cannot have more than uh, seven for the contention free. That's in the standard. Then you can say we should change the standards and so on. But it's just giving you a feeling for these numbers are very, are very small. So if we now look at the, the CSMA part, the, so if we allocate and let someone communicate here. Of course, if there are two is using that, what ha might happen then is we have collision, one needs to back off, or both back off, and then someone use a later slot, and, and, and so on. This is what, what is happening, right? If we look at that uh, collision free, uh, well, there is only one who is using the, that at the, same, uh, at the same time, right? So let's look at that now. How can we utilize that in a control system? This type of, of uh, feature, so, so, and this is a, a proposal that we, we came up with here, which has to do with how can we implement wireless control in a clever way when we do things in a, an event-based way. So what i drawn up here is a time axis. I have the, this periodic super frame indicating here. In the beginning of each super frame there is a beacon, yet we just make sure that we synchronize the communication here, right? So what I... One thing I can do is that I can use a fixed scheduling first. 
which means that I allocate during this contention free period, I allocate for instance a red guy here in every period for one sensor right? that would be like to, to offline or, or online allocate that slot and then what I can do in the sensor is, is that I check at each time instance if something happened or not if something happened in that case I communicate so you see this, this is one possibility to implement to do the implementation. What is the, uh, where in this particular case I didn't communicate anything here, 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 I had something to communicate, then I communicate, I close the loop and I act. And then I have nothing again. So the advantage here is that if anything happened during this period I will react. If nothing happens I have wasted the bandwidth resources in this, in this type. Right? So what is the other principle I could work over? And a completely different principle is a predictive principle, or is sometimes called a self-triggered principle. Then instead what I say is that, let's say that I, I start by having a communication instance and I do a control action, and let's say that that happens here. What can I, I can do at that moment is that I can now predict when will I, uh, when will I next time want to have a communication to happen. So based on that measurement I can do that calculation and in this case it happens to be so that okay I need the next triggering happening at this instant. So you see so in this case it's actually much more efficient in bandwidth because it's only when I in a sense need a transmission because I have decided to make a transition based on the information I have of the system that I do that so this is, this is a good thing, there are much less communication events than previously. The bad thing, what is that? The bad thing is that what happens if I have a disturbance at this moment? I won't detect that until here because this is the next time when I will transmit a, a, a message, right? So can I now do something where I can combine what I had on previous slide with this, which use less bandwidth. So can I have a hybrid scheme here? And the answer is, is, uh, is yes. So I can combine now exactly this the con contention access period and, and, and the collision free period in, in exactly this way. So what I do is that at one moment I have been transmitting, I plan for the next event which I would like to sample the sensor. So the sensor knows that I'm going to, to, to uh, to transmit at that moment. If there is a disturbance happening here, then I can, I can use the contention access period and transmit that and then do the collision. So you see by, by just combining these two I can get something which is, is now efficient in the bandwidth but still robust to the disturbances. So in the, in the motivating application that I show you in the beginning, these are kind of the schemes that we have been, been uh, implementing and, and been running. So um, you can intuitively think that uh, you, you, uh, it, it's nice to, so to say, be able to know that you always will have an event in the future where you ask the system to react because it means that if a sensor is broken you will detect that because the, the sensor didn't send you anything while if you just do something where a sensor completely decide on its own if I should send something or not how do you know that it's broken or that it's just so that it ha doesn't have any data to, to communicate there is many more interesting problem related to, to this the, the illustration I did here was just for a, for a star topology, right? what if we have a multi-hop topology the multi-hop you might want to have because you have low power, battery powered sensors so you would like them not to use too much power to, to, to transmit and then you get all kind of interesting uh, other problems which I, I, I won't get too much into the, the detail here um, let me just illustrate something that we did recently um, on the routing so if we have sensors here which are communicating over a multi-hop network there are many routing protocols proposed that one can use for, the, for this typically in sensor network literature they are used for collecting data there is for instance something called CTP the collection tree protocol for collecting data 
So a problem there, if you use this type of protocols and use this type of, of routing that they propose, for instance using a certain route in a big network here, if you now have a, a link break somewhere there, it typically in this network now takes time for the information to propagate uh, so that other nodes know that that is a broken link. You see it's a little bit like you're out on a road network. How do you know that there has been a road accident further ahead along that road so you take another one? So you need that information to propagate in the network locally. And how should that be done? And we have been, been uh, looking into uh, that somehow and we also build test beds uh, about that. These are the tanks, by the way, that we talked about in the, in the morning. <laughs> that we, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Anyhow, uh, do I have five more minutes or something like that? Yeah, maybe two, two more minutes. So let's show uh, uh, just something uh, coming back to so a little bit of, of, uh, of mathematics here, just to show some, uh, some, something more on the event-based control here. So let's say that we have a linear system um, driven by noise. So divide, if you want, by dt here, and you see that it says dx equal to a noise term plus u. So it's controlling an integrated system. So it's basically the simplest dynamical system we can think about controlling. So let's, let's leave it with that. So let's say that we would like to control, control that system. And let's say that we are controlling that by doing impulse control. So every time we do the control we can bring the system down to the origin immediately. So it is all again the simplest type of system to control, the simplest type of control action you can do. And let's look into that a little bit. And let's take now that view that you, you raise, that we want to keep control over the amount of uh, uh, resources of the wireless network that we are using, right? That is a very Im important thing in general here. So we measure the average sampling rate, so the average uh, amount of data that is being communicated over the wireless network. And we also have a cost for our system. We want to keep x close to zero, or we want to keep the variance small. Just to define a, a, a system to, to work with. <laughs> so one way of controlling this system now is to put a threshold on when we should do the control action. So if you look here, I can, I can have a, an event detector here which now decide on when I should do this impulse control. So this is somehow how you would do control if you didn't take a class in control, right? So what you would do is that whenever you exceed a certain value you would control the system back to the region, right? And then you would wait and then you control it back to the region and then you, you wait and so on, right? So you look at the value and when the value is, uh, is, is away from where you want to be, you, you do the action. This is very intuitive, right? Remember that in control theory, we didn't develop control theory like that. We deve instead of sampling in space, we sample in time. You send data periodically and then you, you act on that. But this is very intuitive to, to do like that. Okay, so let's, let's look at what happens if we, if we do like that. Uh, just happened that for this very simple system uh, that I, I study here now, the amount of data that we will communicate will just depend on the level that we have between the thresholds. So the smaller the threshold is, the more data we will communicate, of course. The smaller the threshold is, the better is the cost. Uh, quite intuitive, right? Uh, so now what we can... Uh, uh, yeah, so this is uh, something going back to a paper by Ostrom and Bernarsson uh, quite some time ago, where you can now compare, if we do this event-based control, compare that with periodic control, with the same amount of resources of the network, you are always three times better if you do event-based. They did this uh, in, in the end of 90s and has been very much cited and, and uh, generate a lot of research. What, what me and Mabin Rabi, um, who is now on the faculty at Chalmers, uh, asked ourselves what, what if I have communication losses? So what if I sometimes lose data? It seems like if I lose, so actually notice in this picture, I allow myself here to lose data, this was lost, so, so that I continue to, to deviate, right? So if I lose this type of threshold measurements, things could maybe go very bad. And to make the story 
short here, it's actually so that the control performance that you get is equal to this quantity. So if you forget about uh, the delta first, no, no, if you forget about the right, hand, the right part here with the p, you see it's delta squared over 6. That's the same thing that I showed earlier, right? If you now have losses with a, uh, with a probability p, you get this quantity. And you see that if p is equal to 0, we are back to that. If you have a lot of losses, so if p goes to 1, this goes to infinity, right? The performance can be terrible bad. So now you can compare periodic sampling with this event-based sampling and see when should I do one or the other. And the thing is that periodic event-based sampling is always better exactly when the probability of loss is less than 25%. So you get this magic number here, which in a sense is intuitive. If you have few losses, we know that it's, it's good to do event-based. But if you have many losses, you should make sure that you continue having the, the communication. Uh, okay, so that's... Uh, yeah. No, this is an uh, this is an exact uh, uh, this is an exact expression. But notice that it was for a particular system, right? It was for an integrator. For those of you who took like a stochastic differential equation and Ito uh, calculus and these type of things, I mean, I mean this boils down to this Fokker-Planck operator. And and in, in, in this in this particular case, one can actually solve that partial differential equation explicitly. In general case, one need to do that numerically, and, and, and one can deal it in other cases. But it's, it's, we were also surprised that it becomes such a beautiful little formula. Let me show you one, uh, one more formula. Because it's, what if I have acknowledgement here? So what if the event detector knows if the previous message was received or not? Can I do something better? And for instance, why not changing the next level in this way? So instead of, if I, I made a loss, previously I had delta being constant, so it was delta zero, two delta zero, three delta zero. Let's say that next time I, I do instead square root of delta zero, which is less than, than delta zero, right? So I, it's more likely I will have a, an event generated again. If I do that instead, it's actually so that I get another expression now, which looks like this. This was the previous expression you saw, and this, in, with acknowledgement, now I always get something better. So acknowledgement in this setting, as you would expect, right? It would give you something which is, is uh, an improvement of your, of your system. Again, just as you point out, it's for a particular system, but we are very interested more from a, from a fundamental viewpoint. It indicates something which, you, even if you don't have exactly this system, could maybe be useful for, for, for what you're doing. Uh, so now I will just uh, jump a few slides here, <laughs> because I, I know I'm, I'm running out of, uh, of time. I would like to, to just summarize a little bit, conclude what I have been talking about. So, uh, so the message I try to, to make here is this thing about that we have event-based and we have time-based in both in computing, in control, and communication, right? We have these two different worlds, and it's quite interesting when we are trying to do cross-disciplinary thing, like in cyber-physical system, where we need to have models now, and we need to be understand to be able to, to design this system. And I'll just be showing you something here from a control and a wireless networking viewpoint, which could be interesting. In this case, it boils down to how you use the resources. If you have infinite resources, you don't have to care about this. If you have limited resources, you, you, you could use some of the techniques we have been, been doing. Particularly interesting open things is big systems. So multi-loop system, where many things that you are controlling, sensing, parallel. Multi-hop, for instance, take our trucks. Typically, with the communication, you can reach two trucks if you are lucky. You cannot reach, if you have a platoon with five trucks, with the communication technology, you cannot reach. You need multi-hop if you want to. And multi-hop is, is very difficult. And then also application. I think we learned a lot of applica from application, also for proposing the, the theoretical problems here. 
So, so this definitely are going to continue. So the material here will be online, but there is also, if you're interested in papers and more detail, uh, send me an email or check my homepage. There you find the publication. So, okay, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Kala, for this wonderful talk. Any uh, questions from the audience? So I, uh, I wonder, uh, the, the SD that you showed had added in Gaussian noise, I assume because it has nice theoretical properties. Yes, yes. Do you see any sort of nice, small, benchmarky type applications that would not fit this, where you would need some more complicated type of... Uh, you mean for the last thing here with uh, having additive noise into the control yeah. system? Uh, so where you have correlated noise with the state or something like that. I mean, there are cases, but... but uh, uh, I'm thinking so how limited it would be if I only supplied this in a simulation tool. Yeah, no, I don't think it's, it's, it's limited at all. From, from the following viewpoint, I mean, some of the basics when you design, when you do control design, there are two things of, of approximation that you often do, and which are, are, are often valid, and that is, one is that you linearize the system. Right, and this is why. You, why do we linearize systems? It's, just, it's not just because this is the only thing we can do, right? It's also because that we are often controlling system around some equilibrium or some trajectory, and if we are close to something, a linear, you know, we know Taylor expansion, right? This is the first first approximation that we get. A little bit similar if you have a noise, right? If you think about that you do an, an expansion, of course when you have noise you have to be a little bit more careful because things can go wrong, but roughly speaking you can say in many cases here these models with disturbances and measurements, noise and so on, are still so crude. So just taking into account some randomness in your measurement in your state is important, but exactly that randomness is seldom that you model that very, uh, in a very detailed way. So, I, to answer your question with short, no, I, I don't think it's, it's a key thing here. But. It's actually a really interesting thing that comes up a lot, uh, that I've seen also, which is a simpler model, when you kind of test your idea against a simpler model, often you're, you're, you're getting more information when you use a simpler model than if you make a more sophisticated, more specific model, because that has less variance in some sense. So I think it's a very good question. Uh, yeah, but, but I can give you another example just to see how, how we reason about modeling. So if you look at, uh, uh, as, I, as you know, we have been working with, with Scania for 12 years now, so I've been quite involved in the cruise controller and further extension of that and so on. And if, if you look at the the detailed models they have, when we test and validate, we have a Modelica model which has something like 1,000 states. It's a very, very good model. And I mean, it's, it's such a good model, so you actually estimate fuel consumption and also and compare that with the wheel drive. It's very, if you look at the design, so when we are designing, for instance, the, the controllers here for doing the, 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 the distance control and you look at the cruise control, it's often based on a, just a second order, you know, Newton, uh, Newton model, not the linear one. You need nonlinearity. So what nonlinearities do we need? We need the nonlinearities from the air drag. You know, it depends basically on the square, right, if you do some approximation. And that square is actually important, at least in that range, 70 to 90 kilometers that you have. This you need to take into account. And there are some other nonlinearity that comes into play. But if you look at the, the dimension of the system, and, and so, I mean, at least for the designs that we have been doing, that's not be careful. But then when you have done your design, you then use these other models, and you validate, and you run. And then, of course, you implement and test it uh, as well. But I think often in these engineering designs, we are going through a number of these steps, and we, we have to remember that in order to understand the basics there, I mean, our, we have limited capability to think in very high dimensions and be very complicated, for instance, noise models, right? Because so much uh, can, can happen. And, and so, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, uh, your model uh, is 
uh, and the distributed model. And uh, the, something that all of time I'm uh, 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 worried about is uh, uh, communication overhead in distributed model. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to know that uh, this model is optimal uh, uh, as a point of the computer. Uh, uh, of a communication overhead or not? So the weak model, you, you mean this, the big Marco model that I talked about or uh, some other? No, the, using the sensor and uh, the controller and the... Uh, yeah, so, so, so actually what, what I was talking about here, I, so if you think about traditional communication models here, I, I basically mixed up many, I, I, I was in different layers and I, I did, maybe I didn't clarify uh, too much of that, but just to, uh, to illustrate a couple of things, notice that when we talk about this event-based stuff uh, over here, like the communication that we do over, over there is just one bit. Uh, in the case, at least if we are close here, because if we say that, uh, I mean, what I need to know is that I'm, I'm crossed the threshold. Of course, you can add, maybe one bit is not enough, because you know that if you were on the positive or negative side, uh, then maybe you need to know if you would be on the, you know, if you lost one and so on. But we are talking about bits, right? It's extremely low. <laughs> but if you then jump back to what I talked about earlier with these with these models where I have this very, very complicated Markov models. So this was, this was the true, this is really true in some sense, but this is going to the standard, to the standard document of IEEE, of this protocol. One go through there and that described as a finite state machine, right? Going through that protocol exactly, modeling that as this, uh, this state machine or this Markov model. And this is one layer, right? It's a Mac layer of the OSI stack. But this is, in some sense, the truth now. So, so just to illustrate that, that what I've talked about here is, is, is different level of granularity. And um, if there is some message here, it's just that I think one needs to adjust according to what you, the problem you want to solve. It's not like one model fits everything here. Yeah. Yes. Go forward to this, uh, scheduling of the modules. Yeah. A uh, little further. There you can talk about. Uh, you said that you made the scheduling depending on the uh, estimated needs uh, of an event. Yeah, yeah, that was the uh, second, right, this one. Did yeah. you do that uh, scheduling uh, independent, uh, sort of all variables or sensors independently? So in this, in this case, what, what we do here is that when a transmission has happened, so, so let's say that we are standing here, so you have some, some measurement, so you know where you are in your state, then you say that you have here a model of the plant, right? So you, you can predict now the evolution of the system, because you, the control is generating the control, right? So the controller know what is going in here, the controller has a model of the plant, so, so she can now estimate when will I next time generate an event. So you basically can say that you're integrating a differential equation forward in time, and then you say oh, it's likely that I will have to jump here. And then that time, you can now look at what time instance will that be, and that is this time instance, or an approximation of that, of that time instance. So this is how, how it's done. Yeah, but are you then talking about just one sensor, one actuator sampling? Yeah, so in this, in this case, um, yeah, that's an interesting extension. So, so in the ex explanation here, it was just one, right? You can then imagine that you have, have ten. Ten that is sharing the same controller here, then you can imagine that that controller decide which one should I, if, if they, both of them, so to say, into the future is going to generate a next event over there, the controller could then make sure that the second time or something like that, it generates the event a little bit later, right? Or you can imagine that these ten sensors goes to different units, different controllers, and then you have a bigger problem. Who are you now going to make sure that they are not generating the event simultaneously, but that's where the network manager come in. So in this setting here, the network manager would be the one who is resolving that conflict. I was thinking that 
you could from the controller uh, and the observer decide on which uh, sensor is the most important. Yeah, 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 exactly. And then you could set, uh, schedule that to be sensed first. Yeah, exactly. So this, this is the way one would, 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 uh, would do that. Oh, yeah. What was the ratio between the, the perception or sensing to compared to actuation? Oh, that's an excellent uh, that's an excellent uh, question here because notice that if if we look how it's implemented today in most application, things are synchronized completely, which means that you typically sense in the same rate as you are doing control, in the same rate as you're doing actuation. But then if you think, if you were not, again, if you were not a control person, you're not working in this business, this is typically not the way you are doing it, right? Just look at me, now, now I'm sensing, but I do very little actuation, and now I start doing actuation, and, right? I mean, we, we do this asynchronous. Yeah. And if you now have these common resources th that you, you are, uh, maybe you should then do more sensing, right? and maybe fewer actuation, or maybe do more actuation in certain instances. So we should break that up as well. So one should, could imagine that you run the sensing with one clock, the controller with another clock, and the actuation with uh, a third clock. What I thought of earlier is that you could have a, like a controller which can model the normal behavior of your system, right? Mm -hmm. And then once you control, you could make try to make sure that the next event that you receive from the sensor actually reflects the current situation of the, the, the plant. So the controller can, can evaluate if my actuation reflected uh, the, the output of the sensor. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And if you look back on what I talked about when I talked about this, uh, this uh, event-based scheduler, this was actually what was going on there, right? So in here, this was what the controller was thinking about reality now, based on the information that uh, the controller has, and this is the truth now. And if they deviate, so if what the controller believes the state of the world is, if that deviates from what my measurement says, then I communicate, otherwise not. So you, yeah, this is, this is a sound, very sound principle, and, and this has been uh, studied in various contexts. You look at the innovation, I mean it's only the innovation that you, you need to communicate. You don't need to communicate absolute value, right? You tell the news. I mean, just compare if you do a, a coding of images, right? You often do something similar, some differential coding is exactly this thing and you say now we should do that also when we do control. Yeah. You had this uh, formula that was proven that you got uh, I don't know if it was three times better or four times better. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, you talk and I will uh, find it, right? <laughs> I guess um, the rate, the communication rate to get so to say, in this control group depends on the gain in, in the control group. So yeah, yeah, no, but, but, but notice that this, uh, I, I, I did a very, I, I, I did something which, um, we, we typically don't teach. So I, I did impulse control here. This is imp the Dirac impulse function. So if I measure the state x at time tau n, I do an impulse then in discrete time to, to the, sorry, in continuous time to the u, which means I, I say that I drive down the state instantaneously. Yeah. Usually if we do a PID control or something like that, right? We, 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 we say that we cannot drive it down instantaneously. We say that we, we do... We have, a we have a slow rate. Why do we say that? Because if we do things instantaneously, usually we need a lot of power, right? But here I did this to, to, to simplify my world. But also it's a matter of, of granular, it's a matter of abstraction, right? Because if you think that you have a disturbance and you bring it down, you get the response which looks something like that, right? If I now move away, this will look like an impulse. So you can say that this is like thinking about the world, the control actions as impulses, simplification. Yeah. It's really interesting in relation to the previous slide where the sensor has a model of the controller mm -hmm. um, and your remarks about sensing. I think a lot of the biological sensors are kind of like that. They, they tend to focus more on the differences. And I think that cats and uh, feline 
mammals, their vision is also very sensitive to changes. Yeah. So those are, in some ways, their eyes are more, have more of a model of how they want to use this information than, uh, than maybe other mammals. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from, from the audience? Great. Well, uh, we're going to have uh, some coffee and cake outside where we can have our, continue our conversations with uh, Kala. But uh, we have a tradition also here. Thank you very much, Roland, of no. giving a small present to our speaker. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you for this wonderful talk. Thank, thank you. you.